He had his gun, so he just swung it open. I start to notice that, you know, the atmosphere feels a little bit weird. First thing he seen was this six and a half foot tall, broad shoulder, dark hair. That freaked him out. And we hadn't talked to her about like life and death and what any of that means. She's three years old, you know. So we turned around. Suddenly there's a whole tree falling across the road. And she was describing to us that, you know, there was a deceased person uh, that she could she, she could see visually. You're listening to Cryptid Clues, where we tackle the ever-expanding history and mystery of monsters and supernatural madness every Monday. You can find us at cryptidclues.ca for more information, or even check out exclusive content and support us at patreon.com slash cryptidclues. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to this week's episode of Cryptid Clues. I am your host, Taylor, and today we got a nice, hauntingly uh, focused episode that we'll be deep diving into. But before we get into that, be sure to check out last week's episode where Ruben and I deep dive into some extraterrestrial affiliations with the recent eclipse that had occurred. Before that, we explored some more UFO UAP unveiling. So it's been a bit of a trend of extraterrestrial topics lately, but that is not this week's topic. Now, a couple of plugs. You can find us on our website, cryptoclues.ca, social media channels, X, YouTube, Facebook. And if you want to reach out to us directly, cryptoclues at gmail.com. So without further ado, let's get into this. So a little history. Vancouver Island is where I am from initially. Beautiful place located in British Columbia. And I must say, when I say island, don't, don't assume it's like a small little spot out in the ocean. It's really, really huge. There's a popular hiking spot uh, called Mount Benson, and this position here, when you get to the very top, yields a wonderful 360 view of the island. On one side, you have the ocean that just meets the mainland of Vancouver far off in the distance, and on the opposite side of you, if you turn to look behind, you'll see not ocean like you might expect, but just mountains and forest. It goes on and on and on. This island is massive. The island is noted for Sasquatch sightings, has a lot of terrain that is very inaccessible to people, so it remains untouched in a lot of parts of this this island. So if my memory serves me correctly, I recall us doing one episode only thus far on Vancouver Island, not devoid of mentions here and there throughout other episodes, but it was particularly focused on the underground cave networks that exist on Vancouver Island. I was on vacation there a couple of years ago and did some cave exploring with a tour guide and the level of exploration information that I learned regarding the ever expanding amount of tunnel systems was absolutely mind blowing. So I definitely recommend tuning into that episode for more information. But aside from cryptids and caverns, the island is home to a rich plethora of iconic landmarks and locations notably affiliated with hauntings. I know a few places prior to doing some research here that were haunted, but those locations were more or less like a tourism kind of uh, appeal until now when I was doing research and found a wide range of hauntings I never knew about on the island. So I'm excited to share this with you. So starting off, let's just paint the idea here. While well, Vancouver Island was inhabited ages ago, its modern day discovery was in 1778, which just blows my mind to think about because you found this massive continent and yet a huge expansion all of a sudden appears with new flora and fauna. It's kind of like getting an expansion pack for an Elder Scrolls game, sort of. It just pops up a whole new island. But the year 1778 puts it at a unique time when things were being established that could become prominent spots for paranormal activity. Things that have the ability to just stand the test of time for a few few centuries and accumulate a lot of negative energy that can harness and manifest into potentially spirits and paranormal activity. So... This following case that we're going to look at is the Bebbin House Haunting. Now, this is a house I have been in many times myself. It's actually been converted on many times into a haunted house for Halloween uh, previously before, before the pandemic. In general, this place serves as an iconic historical haunted location in Nanaimo on Vancouver Island. The house itself was built in the 1930s and ran by the Bebbin family for decades. In 1956, the city of Nanaimo came along and purchased the house and property from the family, and by the mid-1990s, had successfully transitioned it into a multiple rentable area for businesses. And it's after this transition that things started to occur. So the property itself has just 
turned into a massive, massive uh, park, and they have skating rinks, pools. It's just turned into a massive, massive, wonderful property for people that reside on in Nanaimo to really indulge in and enjoy. I played soccer there many times, did kayaking lessons there in the pool. So it's really, really a wonderful facility that they've managed to grow and and really allow the community to indulge in and benefit from. So again, don't forget, now this location, though, had over 60 years of tribulations and history. I'm assuming not all good. I'm sure sometimes it was pretty bad. And the 1930s in Canada was a trying time for families. Unemployment, business closure, life savings were lost. Depression would run rampant for sure. And with depression, sometimes can come along negative energies manifesting in specific places. And it's these manifestations of negative energy, like I said, that in my own personal belief lead to what we call ghosts. So back to the situation at hand, tenants that were working on the site of this Bevan house began noticing strange ongoings. And it was in 1997, uh, the building was converted into a preschool. And even though these reports were years apart, multiple children began claiming they saw and played with an unknown individual at the school. A young Chinese child, they all said was wearing a white gown, had a small braid of hair, one of the witnesses actually recalled seeing this child playing with a small red ball. But what really resonated was these children seeing this unknown kid and telling their parents about it. Again, spaced out by years. It seemed like this, this small child apparition would appear mostly just in the basement area of the house. So the building, how I knew it when I resided on Vancouver Island, was that of a tourist center. And that stage of it uh, was again not devoid of hauntings. Serving as the actual head of the Office of Tourism in Nanaimo, six officials that worked there had actually made public statements over the years to a variety of different local news outlets covering the ongoings that took place with them personally. When working late nights, it warranted individuals moving around in pairs, just that high fear factor, you could say, notably the basement like we alluded to and the attic as well. Now, while the park itself has continued to grow and develop, like we said, the house's rental interest has kind of fizzled over time, but it, the house still stands. Ultimately, it's claimed that three spirits reside in this home, one being the original owner, Frank Bevan. Frank used to have an actual den trophy room in the house, and this was converted into one of the workers' office spaces, and that worker was uh, by the name of Mark Drysdale, and he served as the executive director for tourism in Nanaimo at the time. He reported that while he worked in his office, which was formerly Frank Bevan's den, that sometimes working at his computer, his chair and back would be facing the doorway, but he would on multiple occasions hear someone walking up to his desk from behind him from the doorway, so he would turn around and nothing would be there. And with all these occurrences, they eventually decided, okay, we're going to bring in paranormally heightened and sensitive individuals to read these rooms, see if we can get some answers. It was concluded that the former Den Trophy room was an absolute hotspot. And I quote, this is from what Mark Drysdale said, Spook Central. The last apparition that was seen on site here is a woman in a white dress, usually from the outside, though, seen on the upper floors, just kind of like lurking in, in the window areas. To add to this, lights would be turning on and off, along with the faucets, the, the water faucets in this house turning water on and off. Thankfully, no flooding issues. But when cleaning workers at times did go upstairs, they would report suddenly screams would just be calling out eerily, uh, being shouted from downstairs, even though the building would be closed and staff would have would have been gone. So the cleaners come in, do these things, and it's like, okay, well, who's screaming? No one's there. So as beautiful as Vancouver Island is, it's amazing how truly mysterious things are here and, and not devoid of its own dark history. Like we mentioned prior, dark experiences that create negative areas and environments. One particular environment and scenario is August 28th, 1913. There's a man who went under the nickname Flying Dutchman. His real name was Henry Wagner, and he had been sentenced to death for the murder of a policeman and was hanged in public right downtown on Nanaimo's harbor front. He had been evading police with his partner in crime, Bill Julian, during a massive robbery spree along the coast of the island. There was a firefight that broke out, but ultimately he was captured. This case has been at the forefront of a few ghost tours that I, I just wanted to highlight this particular death because 
I thought, wow, I never knew that before. And I, I grew up in Nanaimo. And so knowing that just right downtown, they were doing live public executions and hangings. It just it baffled me. It really, really did. In 1913, I mean, I'm not sure when things really started to change in the rest of the world on the front of public execution. That seems very semi-modern to me, but man, what do, I, what do I know? I digress. It's been mentioned before on the show, but moving on from the area of Nanaimo, I want to look a little bit more south towards uh, Victoria. And this is a, a city that is much more further south by a couple hours from Nanaimo on Vancouver Island. Notably, the Fairmont Empress Hotel. This is a beautiful building, very historical, and has been the site for some famous and even royal individuals to stay there uh, back in the day. But the building itself has been labeled as a haunted location. Now, it sits right in Victoria's Harbor Front. You can't miss it if you go downtown. The building itself has become a very prominent tourist destination. I've been in there a few times. It, it feels old, but it's absolutely beautiful. The building is not what I'm highlighting today. No, today we're going to be looking towards the Point Ellis House. This is also in Victoria. Now, the property was first acquired and built upon back in 1862 by the Wallace family. And even though they were farmers, eventually the owner changed to an affluent settler family by the name of O'Reilly. And this family stayed on the property until they sold it to the British Columbian government back in 1975. This historical location was sadly adjacent to a terrible occurrence, and this event took place back in 1896, the Point Ellis Bridge disaster. Now, 55 people were killed in this disaster when basically a, a transit bus had fell over the edge, and the bridge soon afterwards collapsed as well, all into the ocean. This incident stands as one of Canada's most notable and lethal transit accidents in our country's history. In the wake of this disaster, the house itself was actually transitioned temporarily into a makeshift morgue. This old history and saddening circumstance of events has just paved the way for paranormal researchers to begin exploring and conducting examinations on the property, which did indeed yield promising results of unknown activity. While the former home today has since become a museum as of 1967, it serves as a focal point for understanding the Métis and mixed-race history of early British Columbia. But the staff and some visitors have not gone devoid of reporting strange activity that they simply cannot explain. This includes the, the classics, doors opening and even closing by themselves, lights turning off and on. But while that's happening in front of people, there are footsteps throughout the house and even piano sounds that can be heard as well. Now, the latest experience I found was that of a pest control individual who was hired to check the basement for their traps. And after going down the stairs, they were convinced that the building's worker at the time who had let them in had followed them down the stairs. But when they turned around at the bottom of the stairs and looked up, they saw, oh my God, like the worker is still at the top of the stairs. Now, this pest control individual insisted that they felt followed and that someone was consistently right behind them in this home. Whether or not this part is an exaggeration or not, it's reported that this individual never returned again to manage the traps. Victoria itself is seen as having very high levels of paranormal activity and just a plethora of locations, not devoid of its own satanic cultist activity either. Locals blame the city's history and geography, but others tend to blame the water ocean as being like a superconductor of activity, so to speak. There's a listener of the show, a friend of mine, shout outs to you, Patrick, if you, if you tune into this episode, a uh, really nice guy. And he mentioned to me some of the ongoings of Victoria's paranormal scene. And that just the fact that it's a port city makes it more susceptible to this type of ongoing experiences uh, on the paranormal side. And it's, it's very fascinating how, how people look at it like that, actually. I never thought to see it from that perspective before, but it does make sense when you have an area that is connected to a port and much more easily accessible and some people are maybe doing a little bit of ill intent things uh, just to be on their way again moving around. I digress however. And our last note on Vancouver Island hauntings, we're going to go up north a little bit now into the Port Alberni area. Now I have some history here. Every summer, my grandparents would take me and my cousins out to a secluded campsite. It sat adjacent to this nice little inlet. Uh, it was 
beautiful and just bountiful, bountiful, bountiful for fishing spring salmon. The dock fishing was not too shabby either. Catching fresh fish, cooking it that same day. Oh, it's a memory I will never, ever forget. I cherish that every day, that thought. Oh, I just still can taste the fish. It was wonderful. As nice as this place is, to my semi-surprise, it seems Alberni has an area about it that is haunted, potentially. Specifically, though, within the Alberni Valley, this is a very, very old haunting from what I had found. Considering Port Alberni became incorporated as a city in 1967, originally it was two separate cities called Port Alberni and Alberni, and they were established in 1912 and 1913, and then they merged together into what is now the current city we know and see. So the Samas River basically flows through the Alberni Valley. There's an old paper mill dam nearby as well, but nearby residents had reportedly witnessed an apparition on multiple occasions, a floating woman that was above the water or sometimes also emerging from the water. And the local story that's affiliated with this apparition is that she is searching for her lost baby and can sometimes be heard calling out as she is seen by the witnesses. What is interesting additionally to this haunting is many people report seeing the ghost lights or orbs floating along the river. Now, I've done a few episodes on orbs and balls of light, and it's quite fascinating how affiliated they really are with paranormal circumstances. It's sort of worth noting, too, that the Alberti Valley is also home to a sea serpent-like creature that supposedly resides in the nearby Cameron Lake. That gained a lot of traction in 2009 from local cryptozoology clubs. I digress, though. Since we mentioned this haunting being very dated. We know this because local residents shared stories of their grandparents recalling and recounting these sightings of the ghost woman when they were kids. But similarities overall with this ghostly apparition have led paranormal researchers to relate this apparition to, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, uh, Yadrona, of the, or the Weeping Woman as well, which is a well-known haunted tale in Mexico and the United States. In short, uh, Yal Llorona was a woman whose husband abandoned her for another. In a fit of rage of this betrayal, she had drowned her children, and they actually discovered her body on the riverbank later. The scenario of this being that same apparition, I personally think that would be slim, because I, I imagine that borders into more of a curse scenario where it would follow people out to their specific areas. But we can see how common women and white are in paranormal sightings across the entire planet. And they each have their own unique meanings depending on which culture and country that they reside in or they're sighted in. It's very fascinating. And throughout my examinations, through all of these hauntings, the note here is the older they are, the more likely you are playing a game of telephone. It's important to write these things down as decades pass because a lot of people sadly aren't superbly reliable these days and information trickling down generation after generation can sometimes, I hate to say it, but it can be exaggerated. One person in a line of 15 people could just turn that thing around. If that one person is like the third person in the line and you got 12 more people after, then I mean, that's that's just it. That's the game of telephone. Uh, so. If you wonder specifically what telephone is, I should elaborate. You sit in a circle, you tell the person on your left a phrase, and that phrase basically is told to the next person, and so forth and so forth, until it reaches the original person. You then see how different the phrase is from the original, and that context is applied to carrying forth generational stories solely through verbal discussions. But just remember, while some things may be expanded upon, for all we know, it could be spot on accurate or be based on something that did initially occur. There's usually a little bit of truth in these things. As I lead into the epilogue now of this episode, there is a sense of excitement that emanates from me when I get to learn about these hauntings on my own home turf. Growing up, I always had a small part of me that loved the idea of Bigfoot, Ogopogo, aliens, and ghosts. But you don't ever think of these things really encountering you, or you encountering them, I should say. The older I, I got now, and personally, it becomes a wonder to learn just how common hauntings and sightings of paranormal and cryptids alike become. Vancouver Island is a few centuries old for settlers, but its history is rich and ancient for the unknown. Like I said before, the, like the tunnel systems and everything, there's so much to discover here, and I miss living there every single day. But until the mega quake happens, I won't be going back to live there anytime soon. 
which for a little context, Vancouver Island sits atop a subduction zone, which is a region where one of the Earth's tectonic plates is thrusting underneath another tectonic plate. This specific subduction zone is the Juan de Fuca plate that is thrusting beneath the North American plate. And as they keep moving towards each other, the buildup of strained energy here it will just start to exceed the friction and a huge mega quake is just going to unfold. There's lots of small quakes that have been occurring here, but I keep seeing these articles that scientifically speaking, the mega quake is overdue, which only fuels my urge to be uncomfortable and stay away from Vancouver Island. But every year when I go to visit the island and see family, a part of me still remains apprehensive to it happening while I'm there. I'm always thinking, okay, what's my escape plan? <laughs> you just never know. But the reason I wanted to mention this is because if we look at Japan, after they experienced the terrible earthquake of 2011, there was at least 20,000 people that had lost their lives in this severe natural disaster. You have a tsunami mixed in there too. It was just truly devastating. But once the dust had settled and restoration was underway and things began to be as they were, hauntings started to become rampant throughout the city. Not malicious or devious, but in my view of it, just lost and stagnant, I would say, if that's the correct word. And it's prominent, particularly among taxi drivers, where dash cam footage will capture apparitions in the back of their vehicles. Some drivers report a person getting into their car, and as they start driving, they think it's a customer, but they turn around, and the guy's gone. So if such devastation were to hit Vancouver Island, I personally believe that after the restoration efforts conclude, you would see similar, if not the very same type of hauntings begin to take place across all these affected areas of the island and in, in the cities and whatnot. But that, of course, is my own personal opinion, not factual in any sense, but I thought it was just an interesting thing to bring up. The, the, I don't like saying the possibility because that sounds like a, neg a, a positive word on a negative situation and there is nothing positive about uh, an earthquake killing people and a tsunami killing people or anything like that it's as much as i understand these natural disasters are natural they remain a disaster nonetheless so hopefully this information within this episode has piqued your curiosity and the next time you're visiting vancouver island british columbia canada you can take a gander and explore the mysteriously haunted locations for yourself and form your own deductions uh just to expand upon these little little other areas tofino is another place that's not devoid of having a few hauntings. There's lots of other places in Victoria. Nanaimo has a few other places as well. Even Sook has uh, has a few interesting places there of hauntings that I managed to find in, in addition. So there is just a, like I said, a rich mystery to this island. And I love it every time I get to explore it. So if you happen to check it out and find these haunted locations for yourself, then... Maybe you can form your own deductions and perspectives and discoveries as well. Until then, everyone, you can find more Cryptic Clues on our website, crypticclues.ca, our social media channel, social media, social media channels, X, YouTube, Facebook, and Patreon. Should you wish to contact us directly, you can do so via our email, cryptidclues at gmail.com. Thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. Have a great week, and remember, take care and stay safe. Thank you.